Sometimes chairing in conferences like this is a chore, and, and other times it's a pleasure. It, it's a pleasure when you've got someone who's speaking who is absolute master of their field uh, and a very accomplished speaker. So that'll give me a, a very easy job as, as chairman. Uh, Greg Schultz, who I, I'm sure many of you are aware of from his, his publications and may have heard him speak before, uh, has a, a, a heritage of about 30 years research in, in biomedical science. Uh, he's just informed me that my original estimate of 125 published articles in peer-reviewed journals is well out of date. It is now uh, over 150 with uh, various chapters and other articles taking him well over the 200 mark. So um, at a risk of embarrassing you, Greg, we have a very accomplished researcher and publisher uh, speaking for us. He's done a lot of work with skin wound healing, uh, eye wound healing, uh, and vascular research. Uh, the, certainly the fields of, of research that I'm familiar with are those that deal with growth factors. Uh, more recently, a lot of very interesting work with matrix metalloproteases. And from the clinical perspective, uh, Greg has been instrumental in contributing towards our understanding of wound bed preparation principles and the principles of time in wound assessment. Um, I think that's really enough for me to uh, get you off the ground, Greg. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy this. I'm sure you will. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a tremendous uh, pleasure to be back to Wounds uh, UK at Harrogate. Uh, I was here about three years ago and thoroughly enjoyed it. And the good news for me is I usually end up taking back some very important information. What I hope to do today uh, is, in about 40 minutes, review with you some basic principles of wound healing and, as the title implies, try to give you some concepts of advanced wound healing and particularly how to try to translate all of that boring biochemistry that I do into things that are really relevant for you. Uh, because, as David says, this is where the rubber meets the road and we can do very good things in the laboratory and get very excited about the biochemistry that uh, we find in, in wound healing. But unless we can translate into that into things that are really practical, then we've only half met our challenge. So I bring you greetings from the University of Florida. Uh, we uh, are located, for most of you who uh, don't know uh, the geography of Florida, uh, we're in Gainesville, Florida, which is two hours north of where you do know, and that's Disney World. So uh, as I said, I'm going to try to give you a combined uh, and intense overview of the basic molecular and cellular regulation of wound healing. And then we're going to try to drill down and find out what goes wrong when wounds don't heal. And then if we can understand the basic molecular and cellular abnormalities of wounds that don't heal, how we can design more targeted therapies that will hopefully be more efficient. So certainly for this audience, uh, this type of a diagram uh, is really uh, somewhat redundant, but it does allow me to point out some of the key things that I want to point uh, want to bring to you. First, as we look at normal healing in a vascularized skin uh, injury, that goes uh, over a period of, of weeks and months and years into the final mature scar, we can break that down into the four phases of healing that you're well familiar with, the hemostasis, inflammation, repair, uh, or proliferation, migration, uh, and matrix uh, dep deposition into the remodeling. And the reason that I want to spend just a moment on this is because in acute wound healing that goes on to heal properly, what we really are able to determine is that there are certain sequential phases that must occur before the wound can progress uh, through these phases and, and uh, heal. And particularly at the first, in vascularized tissues, you're aware there's the clotting phenomenon, the hemostasis, the vascular response. And this does two really very important things to set up the subsequent phases of healing. First, this is the uh, phase in which the provisional wound matrix is deposited, and that predominantly is con uh, constructed of fibrin and some fibronectin from the plasma. And it is this provisional wound matrix that really provides the scaffolding in which wound healing will occur. But let me emphasize to you that this scaffolding is not inert. Uh, in fact, it is very important in communicating the contents uh, of this abnormal matrix to the cells that are going to move into the wound, particularly things like fibroblasts, fractured epithelial cells, and epithelial cells. And those cells, as they move in, recognize this provisional wound matrix through their integrin receptors. 
And when a fibroblast moves from the normal collagen matrix in the dermis into the fibrin matrix in the provisional wound matrix, it sets off a whole cascade of different gene expression patterns. So this provisional wound matrix is not an inert scaffolding by itself. It does provide that phenomenon, but it also is communicating to the fibroblasts and other cells that this is not your normal dermis. This is a, a, a abnormal component that, is, that signals the cells to begin shifting into a gene expression profile for repair. The other key thing that happens during this early phase uh, of, uh, of wound healing is that the platelets degranulate and they release prepackaged uh, active growth factors uh, into this provisional wound matrix. And in fact, studies in animals have shown that if we reduce the platelets very dramatically in animal models, we will actually slow the initial phases of wound healing uh, and, and retard the uh, rate at which wound, wound healing can progress. The next phases that uh, is important is inflammation. And clearly, in normal wound healing, this is necessary. If we remove many of the inflammatory cells uh, in uh, acute animal wound models, we again retard wound healing. These inflammatory cells uh, initially peak within about the first 24 hours to 48 hours with neutrophils. They undergo phagocytosis and through their reactive oxygen uh, generation kill the invading microorganisms. Uh, they also secrete proteases. And those proteases, neutrophil elastase, which is a serine protease, and the matrix metalloproteinases, uh, the gelatinase and collagenase, are very important in enabling the new matrix to integrate into the damaged matrix. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think of a brick wall, because the brick wall with its bricks aligned in a, a particular um, uh, structured order is very much like how collagen molecules have to align with each other to provide the proper uh, structural properties of the matrix. So collagen molecules, as they're synthesized, interact with other collagen molecules in a head-to-tail, head-to-tail, head-to-tail arrangement. They also align laterally with about a one-third overlap of the structure of that rod of collagen. If the collagen molecules are damaged during the injury, new collagen molecules cannot properly align with the collagen molecules that are in the wound. And so the proteases must come in and chew back these damaged, partly denatured collagen molecules until, new in, until the uh, intact collagen molecules are able to be recognized by the new collagen molecules that are being laid down. So in a brick wall, using that analogy, if you're remodeling a brick wall and you come in with a sledgehammer hammer and you knock down a portion of that wall, some of those bricks are going to fracture halfway down and, and they won't be properly aligned. Well, before you can add new bricks back into that wall, you must knock out, you must take out those partly damaged bricks before you can align and uh, properly register the new bricks into that wall. That's exactly what has to happen when collagen molecules that are newly synthesized have to integrate into the existing collagen structure around the wound. Within about two days to four days, the neutrophils will undergo apoptosis that programs cell death unless there's a continuing infection, and then they're replaced by the, the circulating monocytes that activate into macrophages. And the macrophages continue that process of, of uh, surveying the wound to be sure there's no, inflama uh, no uh, uh, bacteria, but eventually this inflammatory response will decrease. And this is a going to, as you'll see in a second, going to be a very key component of what is different between acute wounds that are healing and chronic wounds that fail to heal because there is a prolonged elevated inflammatory phase within all chronic wounds that have been studied in general. Now this doesn't mean that the wounds are infected or that they are red and uh, hot and, and have the characteristics that you would say of a frank infection, but at a molecular level they are in a hyper-inflamed status. And it is that hyper-inflamed status that sets up many of the animal properties that we'll look at in a second. Then finally, when this provisional wound matrix is mature enough and if collagen has been laid down, the epithelial cells will begin to migrate, to resurface the wound, and close that. That growth will be supported by adequate angiogenesis through